Hi everybody, welcome to another episode of Architect Tomorrow. I'm really pleased to be talking about um, sustainability and to the sustainability of technology. In particular, we're going to talk about serverless. Is that a nice answer, a nice option uh, when you're considering how to make your technology more sustainable when it comes to cloud deployment? I'm joined by Daniel, Daniel Bass, co-founder and CTO. Have I got that right? Of Zeti? Good. Yeah. So, so Daniel, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. We crossed paths because you did a great talk, I think, at uh, an Azure webinar. It was very obvious you're kind of passionate about this, this topic. But before we get into all that, I really like the people that come on the podcast just to give us a little bit of a flavor of who they are. And I noticed sort of looking at your profile um, that you've, you've written a book on serverless. So that's interesting that you're a book author, but you appear to have like a kind of sciences, physics kind of background. So yeah, talk us, talk us a little bit about your sort of journey into where you are today. Yeah, for sure. So um, thanks for having me. And um, yeah, my kind of journey into tech was um, I studied physics at, at UCL. Um, I'd never done any programming really before that. Um, I realise now that um, when I was very young, I made a game on one of those little game maker things that kids uh, could use, right? And then got my friends to play it for, for a charity event. And probably now that would be flagged up instantly as like, yeah, I just I, I wouldn't be able to move for Python courses, right? But um, <laughs> back, back then, you know, it didn't really get um, get flagged that much. So yeah, the first time I properly programmed was as part of that course. Um, they would, they did a um, a Java module. So being nervous for the course, I bought the for dummies Java book um, over the summer, read it, and then got into the course and realised that the course was the for dummies Java book. The the uh, <laughs> It's literally exactly the same, um, which is great for my grades, but perhaps not <laughs> so much for my learning process. Um, but yeah, I think from then I kind of realized actually that's what I want to kind of do for work, if you see what I mean. I, I love physics and find it super interesting, but yeah. building stuff and making computers do, do stuff was yeah. you know, very kind of exciting. So um so yeah, so I managed to get onto a um, internship and then graduate program with uh, MNG Investments, mm -hmm. uh, and that they are a large investment manager. Um, I think their private arm of private debt, which is where I ended up, um, is the largest in Europe. I think so. Right. It's um, a name that a lot of people won't have heard of, but it's kind of no. I've I've certainly heard them. I think people who you know of the sort of financial services world have definitely heard of MNG or certainly yeah known um and I guess probably exposed some quite chunky enterprise scale sort of challenges at that sort of organization yeah it was quite good in the on my graduate program I landed in a team that had just been given this thing called Azure and the cloud and were <laughs> being able to work out how to use it um so that's that's really fortuitous timing for any right. kind of joiner right because it's like right no one knows what's going on here. Obviously, everyone has existing experience, which is fast how it strips yours, but you can kind of go in and learn all the new stuff. So I kind of did that. And there's a few different bits and pieces of technologies, but as your functions kind of really kind of stuck with me from there. Right. And I think it was, I think I was still on my graduate program. I think it must have been like 12 months in or something. Um, I was approached to write my first book. And I wrote that um, about as your serverless um and then um yeah kind of progressed from there software developer and then senior software developer leading up the private credit kind of function for software yeah. development and having like a small team kind of reporting into me i kind of got to a point where i was like i you know i'm, I'm loving building stuff but i really want to really build like my own thing entirely if you like right i kind of looked out for um I, it was actually on angel list um, uh, okay you know startups that wanted a cto and um yeah and met up with dan and we only have co-founders called dan in our company and uh, <laughs> amazing and uh yeah and then the rest is history really and was co-founded zeti i'm sh i'm sure zeti is a very different you know world to sort of you know big big corporate bank um but talk to us a bit about that that's it zeti because it's for me it was really interesting so it, my understanding is it's sort of electric car sort of financing in a different way is that right or have i got that wrong yeah, that's exactly right. So um, electric cars, 
um, are a key part of kind of the sustainability goals, um, you know, as part of like the UN's goals for tackling climate crisis. Um, so Zeti's really kind of honed in on on fixing that. That's kind of a, yep. a big thing. Um, and when we say electric, we also include hydrogen as part of that. Um, okay, that's controversial. That's quite a quite a divisive topic, but we'll perhaps steer <laughs> off that one and move, keep moving. Certainly is. But like generally for us, it's all about, you know, solutions that can work at scale. Yeah. And actually that in many cases is obviously where hydrogen isn't quite there yet. But in, in principle, we wouldn't have a have a problem with hydrogen projects. Yeah. And in fact, we are talking through a few at the moment. And we don't just look at cars, we actually look at larger vehicles, so buses, HGVs, trucks, vans. Because actually that's just probably arguably where, and we need to be a little bit careful not to get into EV in depth, because I'm a bit of EV head, I've got two. Um, <laughs> and they're too expensive. And so the financing aspect is really, really interesting that you're sort of looking at that. But also the personal car transport is only really one part of the equation. Like all of those trips by van and commercial vehicles and other things is absolutely another part of the of the problem. So it's really interesting that you're tackling that side of things as well. I also think I saw something about air quality on your LinkedIn as well, which is a is an angle of all this sort of area that I think a lot of people overlook. They they of course there's a decarbonisation aspect, but the thing that I think is almost kept under the radar because it's actually not a great story when it comes to big cities, right? The level of pollution in big cities, particularly London and Birmingham and other places, is not great. Actually, the you know, the clean air zones and all that sort of stuff, as, as divisive and controversial as they are, for me, in the short term, actually, the air quality thing it, it is more of an immediate benefit for a lot of people living in cities. I don't think people quite realise like the impact on asthma and respiratory-related diseases and things. So I think the EV thing... And a lot, you know, if you don't agree with the decarbonisation piece, uh, separate sort of topic, but the whole air quality piece, I think, is equally important. But there was a little project you did on air pollution. Is that right? Or am I? Yeah. 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 So we've um, we one of our initial kind of goals with air pollution and one of the things that kind of um, struck a chord, I guess, particularly with uh, with Dan, my co-founder, is um, uh, diesel buses that take children to school. Right. So the levels of um, NOx pollution inside mm -hmm. of these bus are approximately 10 times higher than if you're on the road. Wow. Um, that is a stat which is probably out of date, by the way. Oh, OK. <laughs> but, you know, that's it's, it's approximate. Let's just say that. But yep. it's, it's quite kind of a serious issue. And there's a recent study that just came out a few days ago, I think, that shows that exposure to um, traffic pollution decreases brain um, activity within hours. So wow. like it's a, it's a real kind of serious issue. Yeah. So um, our kind of model is like, we'll only do kind of clean vehicles, but if we were just doing finance the normal way and just doing clean vehicles, then all it really is is a normal finance company with a good green label on the side. Right. You actually need the technology and where we're kind of, what we're effectively doing is offering a new service and that, but the catch for fleet operators is they must go to clean vehicles to get the new thing that they want. Okay. So that kind of thing of trying to trying to lever towards that that good kind of kind of outcome. And the key thing that a lot of fleet operators have wanted for a long time is um, paper mile finance. So what that means is rather than paying a fixed monthly cost mm -hmm. for, for financing a vehicle. So, you know, if you went out and leased a car today, you would agree to pay X hundred pounds a month. It's exactly the same for businesses leasing a thousand cars. You would think it would be different, but it's actually pretty much not. Right. Um, just the sums involved are much bigger. Mm. Um, for us, what we say is, well, actually, instead of paying a fixed monthly cost, you can pay based on how much you drive that vehicle that month. Right. Drive zero miles, you will pay zero pounds for your finance that month. And um, we have... Wow, that's okay. Right. Yeah, and we've actually seen that. We've sent people bills for zero pounds which is is great because they're using the flexibility of the model. Now, mm. there is a kind of a, a key problem that immediately follows up there is like, well, what stops people from, you know, buying a Tesla as a lawn ornament? <laughs> you know, it looks really good in front of my house, right? So um, we also yeah. have, tech, you know, to make the financing work, um, we have every six months, they have to drive a certain amount. And if they don't, they pay as though they had. Right. So you get a lot of flexibility within that six months, but... Yeah. ultimately you do have to actually ultimately it's a commercial model and you can't give away things for free. Yeah. there's no such thing as a free lunch unfortunately yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. If, you know if, if someone was going around giving away you know free ev financing then then fine and and to be fair we can integrate with like grants and stuff like that much mm. more financing 
Um, but yeah, so that, that kind of product is um, really attractive to fleet operators, particularly during the COVID pandemic. So um, we had a lot of taxi drivers, they weren't allowed to drive. So their mileage went right down. But all of their conventional debt was saying, well, you still need to pay us. Um, but they weren't earning any money. So whereas with our model, they could ramp down their payments. So it was mm. a kind of significant um, improvement for them. And obviously that memory is is seared into everyone's minds. Um, so the, the the kind of, I think everyone understands now the value of that kind of flexibility. It's a, it's a bit like when you book a hotel now and they're always, not always, but very regularly, they have much more generous cancellation policies than they have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, and then that's how can we need the technology, if you like. That's why there's a CTO. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, uh, the, one of the reasons I, I know I was really keen to get you talking on the on the on the uh, podcast was you're not only looking at the sort of how do you make tech greener, but you're also using tech to you know make make the world more sustainable uh, or you know take us on that on that journey. So uh, that, that's why I was sort of yeah really looking forward to this conversation because there's both angles of this we can talk about. And as much as I could go on about EVs all day, I am really keen, though, to move on to your kind of take on serverless uh, sustainability or how green is, is, is serverless. And the thing I think that struck me, and if you don't mind, what I'll probably do is include the graphic, I think, from your slides with the idling car, is, is like comparing running a server all the time to like leaving your car running when you're not driving it, right? But, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I've just stolen your thunder there, but uh, how, I, I guess... Did that analogy, I guess, come to you from the Zeti work or was that something that you were already using in your sort of writing and things anyway? It was kind of interesting. It kind of, yeah, I think it kind of came to me whilst I was in the Zeti office writing the Microsoft talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think, right, like how yeah. do I come up with a, what's a great, you know, what's a nice, easy to understand analogy, right? And obviously being around my previous industries, investment management had nothing to do with cars, right? So, um, but now you're kind of around, you know, we're talking to manufacturers like most days. We, you know, I'm kind of around cars more than I ever have been before. Mm -hmm. so I've probably influenced it somewhat. Um, but yeah, so my my kind of view on the sustainability of serverless versus normal, uh, normal server deployments, if you like, is that, um, you know, if you drove your car home at the end of the day, parked it up in front of your house, and then left the keys in the ignition and the engine running, and then went into your house and went to sleep. Um, and then the, the whole reason why you did that was because in the morning, you wouldn't have to switch the engine on, which takes, you know, two seconds or longer if it's an older car, right? Um, people would say that that's not normal. <laughs> so that's, they would say that's very, very wasteful. You're burning a lot of water overnight. It's going to cost you a lot of money. Um, never mind the air pollution stuff that we mentioned earlier. Mm. Um, so it's it's kind of a similar thing with serverless kind of versus normal services. You leave the server running overnight when, particularly in the early days of a startup, for, for my personal experience, you have no one on that website for <laughs> overnight, right? Because, you, you know, yep. it's very early days. Yep. But even when you've actually only got 3%, you know, that's still, you're running a 100% bin server for 3% of your customers when you could cut down the size and reduce your um, your emissions significantly because of that. I guess it's, this is where we're sort of taking advantage of the shared computing model beyond just the sort of cost saving element, but it's also the other. Uh, but I guess we, we someone could throw stuff. I mean, there's, there's the sort of devil on my shoulder here that's saying, well, hang on. Isn't this just about the amount that you're using that compute? And actually, that compute is probably still running somewhere anyway. It's just, and does this sort of get into a scope, scope three versus an imaginary scope four, where you know it, it would be your emissions, but you're kind of almost going, well, I'm not running a workload on at the moment, but the cloud provider has still got it's in there. But I, I, I guess the, the point is that it, this can be elastic, and the cloud provider can 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 ramp up and ramp down behind the scenes, and I'm sure they almost certainly do because it wouldn't make sense for them to be running kit that's not needed um so I, I i totally get it and i think the other bit which would be interesting to, to hear if you're if you're looking at this as well is when i was building um sort of ai processing platforms a few years ago this kind of getting things as asynchronous as possible right so that you could decouple the demand from the execution such that you could then scale up and scale down the workload so i think that the synchronous model where you know, you need something running all the time that's there to kind of take the request and run it. it it's almost like the easy architecture pattern, right? Everyone understands a RESTful API or they understand 
that kind of you know end tier architecture where everything's just spun up running all the time where this gets harder and cleverer is rethinking that architecture almost like throwing that architecture away and going right how do i break down my problem such that i'm not running compute all the time that i am making use of serverless or step functions or um lambda things or you know i've, I've got auto scaling groups or whatever this, this this is where the cloud is hard because it's easy to get your credit card out and just start spinning up infrastructure as a service or whatever and lifting and shifting workloads but actually no it's like you stop and think about re-architecting the problem i guess Maybe Zeti, you've had been able to start with a clean slate, right? So it's been easy, but how much of the sort of rethinking of the architecture is needed to really take advantage of this sort of way of way of working? Yeah, so it, that's where I sort of get on to um, serverless not being a static thing. Right. So, um, the common kind of market like understanding is that serverless is FAS, which is, you know, Azure functions, Lambda, Google Cloud functions, and x others right like netlify functions and things like that so um for me how serverless something is is really about how much i care about the servers less okay that's my kind of point of view on it so something that's auto scaling is already that's already getting quite a big tick in the in the serverlessness box something that i don't have to care what version it's running on because you know it's the cloud provider that's providing a service for me or doesn't you know they don't have to identify as a normal cloud provider it could be um like a dedicated database for a provider like snowflake for example um and then you know um do i have to manage the core count or process account or you, you know like all of that kind of do i need to understand uh, it sounds ridiculous because we're technology people but do i have to understand the underlying technology and the way those resources work you know and if you do then to me that's a that's a downside because I don't care if I'm sending re requests into a service, I don't care whether they need to be served by RAM or C CPU counts. I just want the result. Right. Um, so it's all very like results oriented. So what that means really is like, if you wanted to lift and shift some an existing application, if you wanted to go the full whole hog and you know go as you mentioned Lambda step functions or Azure functions with durable functions, which are roughly equivalent, um, then yeah, you know what that's going to take some architecture work. There's no <laughs> there's no pretending it won't right. Um, but actually, you can get pretty close by spinning up. I'm going to use Azure examples because that's my expertise, but Cosmos, for example, in MongoDB or Cassandra mode, mm -hmm. also has serverless, so you only pay for the requests that you actually use. Yeah. Then you can go out and spin up a um, app service, um, which can also auto scale. It's not as nice as, as your functions auto scaling, but right. it, it does do it. Um, and then you've kind of got your classic kind of database and app server, and you can run your normal kind of um, MVC yep. stuff in there and it, it's mm. it's kind of all quite straightforward um but that then you get i would say 80 percent of the benefits but without significant rework then if you need to get the higher benefits then yeah you know what that's that, <laughs> that is some re-architecting unfortunately <laughs> it's it's interesting actually in a, in a way that the cloud has now evolved to the point where what you're describing is probably far easier than trying to build things the old way and but it's a mindset shift right i think if you've if you've come into the profession since cloud has been available, then mm. I think you think differently. You think differently about security models and risk models. You think about deployment models differently. You, you probably think about dev, DevOps pipelines. There's, there's certain things that are just you know, more familiar because that's the world you've grown up in. Uh, the, I, I guess I, I was pre-cloud, um, but an early adopter of, of, of it. But, but even still, you know, my mind is still, I suppose, was baked back when you know I still had to build the flame and server myself. I'd go and rack it and you know and, and care about it. And so I guess there's this whole cattle and pets thing where you know, which I'm sure, for those that don't 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 know that the cattle versus pets analogy is, you know, if you have a pet, you need to kind of look after it, you need to feed and water it. So that's like a physical server or a you know physical device, maybe a laptop something you own. You really care about it, and then uh, cattle. Um, it's not a, it's not a very vegetarian compatible analogy, but never mind. <laughs> Cattle is all about, you know, kind of um, spinning up a whole, whole bunch of ser services and then kind of killing them off when you don't need them. So you kind of, fart, you're kind of, you know, you, you don't, you don't name your individual cow. Uh, and it, 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 it essentially is part of the 
food production system and that's essentially what kind of containers and service compute kind of world is and uh, maybe I'll throw up a graphic I pulled together a, a while ago that shows that spectrum of pet to cattle but um, and I've now gone so deep in this analogy I'm now struggling to remember where we started from but anyway that's always the joy with some of these analogies you can get lost in the analogy but I guess ultimately um, yeah how you think about these things dictates uh, yeah where, where your mindset is on cattle versus pets I think for, for me uh, I always have to sort of go no Oliver you're thinking too pet like you need to think more more cattle like because the world has gone that way but I guess I come back to it's easy for say for someone like Zeti with a green field to go right we're going to build this a nice clean cloud native way it's difficult I think for other organizations to get their head around right I've got all this legacy stuff and you know it's just it, it's just so far away from serverless <laughs> you know it's like yeah, yeah. maybe the new projects that are coming along maybe like the newer digital experience or kind of more customer facing apps are going that way but i've still got all my core banking or my core customer crm billing platforms and stuff they're all still very end tier very infrastructure as a service if that maybe even they're still on-prem so i i, I like having conversations like this because i think hopefully they help people understand that there are the other ways there are other models um and there's a for me there's a step of enlightenment of going oh okay so cloud isn't just someone else's computer. It's fundamentally a different operating model that you need to kind of get your head around. Um, and for me, I'm still, I'm still on that journey. I mean, I think I get a lot of it, but the problem is the cloud keeps moving, doesn't it? So, um, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, so one of the things that might shock people uh, is we, we, we uh, maybe not, I don't know. So we don't have an on-prem at all. As I right. We also don't have like a, a network or anything everything is kind of cloud-based so you're and, completely like zero trust as an organization kind of yeah like, the whole model is zero trust yeah um, you know we've well, got them somewhere um perhaps on me i do you know we've got these uh uh fido keys right all of that kind of stuff so um and the thing is you're right that's a benefit of being of of starting fresh if you like um but one of the things i would say is like if you as you say, bring on new projects and then just tr try it out. And the main thing that I would say with serverless, which is the commercial benefit, we obviously talked about the sustainability benefit. Yep. Yep. Uh, and it's a key part of our mission. But frankly, if I was working in a company which, you know, if, if Zeti wasn't a sustainability company and we, you know, we weren't bothered about that, I still would have used the same technology stack. And that's because commercially it makes much more sense. And that really for for some someone who's always my skill set lends itself towards someone a place that needs custom development, right? So if you're doing custom development, it will be faster on serverless. I can almost guarantee it. You have a bit of a learning curve, obviously, at the start, and you might want to get in, you know, either send some people on training or perhaps get someone in to just sort of help to get that kind of started. Um, but the speed of delivery is is kind of mind-bending in, in comparison. And the the reason is, is I'm, I'm slightly flippant when I say, like, you know, I, I care about servers less. But the fact is, is every developer in your organization then doesn't have to care about servers. Mm. No one has to know about subnet masks, right? No one has to know about all of that just get, falls away, right? And they can focus on what they're actually supposed to be doing, which is writing code. right? Um, and all of the infrastructure stuff kind of fades a bit once you've, once you've learned the basics and how to kind of plug it together and you kind of got comfortable. So that is kind of the, the the real advantage when when i was working at mng they they had a lot of on-premise stuff um and our kind of cloud kind of journey was that classic one where you've got a lot of on-premise stuff and all that kind of thing and they were using serverless you know they we we identified that it was more effective um just as secure if not more so you know because this organization in control of billions you yeah. know and it's it was really about not being too ambitious, I would say, by saying we're going to lift and shift every legacy thing straight away because, you know what, your sales team or your accounting team aren't going to be impressed when they find out, <laughs> well, uh, you know, I read on the internet that the cloud was great and now I've lost all of your historic transactions. There's, you know, there's there's pragmatism here, right? <laughs> and that's a really interesting, that's a really interesting take, isn't it, on cloud migration? Because I, I feel like 
Um, and this is a sweeping generalization, so I apologize to anyone listening who actually doesn't, doesn't do it this way, but it feels to me like, oh, the easiest step is for us to sort of just move existing servers to infrastructure as a service. But what you're saying is actually take the bolder step and like re-architect and do it piece by piece, but don't do it like, as in like a small step to cloudification is to take a, a virtual machine on-prem and put it in the cloud. Actually, it's going no. Let's 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 take parts of our business uh, software application state and go right. What bits would make sense to kind of shave off and move over and make them service? Maybe break them down to microservices if that's a sensible approach. Monoliths are also cool. Um, so it's kind of like it's taking that sort of journey and doing it the right way to start with, rather than going okay. Well, we've made a step into the cloud and now we'll re-architect. Because the reality is, will you ever? Will you ever really? because is there enough business value to go right yeah that thing that's kind of working it's in the cloud well tick you've done the cloud tick haven't you were and no there's still technical debt there we need to refactor it and by that point the business people have glazed over and fallen asleep so it, it's a really interesting sort of different approach a different strategy i suppose to cloud migration yeah i think the key thing um and obviously I, I, i'm a cto role so it's business facing as well as as well as tech facing right so if, if you go into that situation where, yeah, you know, you've just moved an existing app onto the cloud, what a business person would think is, right, that took them two months. There's a lot of apps and I've used it and it's the same. And they're really <laughs> happy about that. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And you should be happy because it's really hard, right? But from an outcomes point of view, there's there's been very little visible business outcome, right? There, there will be, I'm sure, security benefits and scalability benefits and things like that. I, 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 and I guess, because one thing we haven't made clear, and I'm just from jumping and make it clear here, is you may get a sustainability benefit in doing that. And, and by, by the fact that your cloud provider may be in a much better position to buy cleaner energy or, you know, have smarter ways of, 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 of cooling and, you know, efficiency through scale. So you do get some benefits, but I hear what you're saying. It's like, you're nibbling away at the benefit case rather than really nailing it. Yeah. Whereas if you want to get people on board saying, yeah, you know what, this stuff, I, I will sign whatever checks they bring me, right, is do something new and exciting, right, a, a new project, a new whatever, even, even proof of concepts to a degree, although I'd be slightly nervous about things that don't, you know, that someone doesn't immediately see as like, mm -hmm there's a real customer on this yeah. um, because you kind of run into the same problem, like, okay, cool. So what kind of problem? Um, so you put something on there and then basically use the full range, right. Of, of things. And then the, the main thing, the main benefit of that is one, you get everyone in the business excited about this cloud thing, rather than thinking it's just an IT thing yeah. about um, or whatever, whatever the internal perception of the cloud is, it varies. Um, and then two, your developers or your your staff who are doing that are going to learn the latest practices, right? And they're going to learn all the latest things. And one of the key things is actually, you mentioned it earlier, is the DevOps side. Um, you know, we, all our, of our environments, and I've kind of, it's, as you said, it depends when, when you started in IT, right? And there's some dependency here. But from the very start, all of our environments are on ARM templates and scripts. That's as your resource manager templates, yeah. right? Yeah. So, um, uh, if if there's an AWS user, it's cloud formation, I guess. Yeah. Yep. Um, so similar sort of thing. Basically, spec what resources you want, and it goes off and spins them up. And you know, it's that's we've always kind of done that. But if if you try and do if you do a new product, you realize you have to do that really for it to make sense. Mm. Um, and then what that helps with is then that internal team go, right, that is how things like the ideal pattern of how things should be done. Now let's go back and shift this thing for a good reason, sustainability, whatever. Um, we can actually do it using rather than carrying across our old man, mindset, we're going to try and do it using our new mindset because we've seen that it works and we trust it because it's serving yeah. customers and it's making them happy. And I think that's kind of a key kind of thing is that you, you learn the newest stuff rather than, I guess, just carrying across the old thinking and just trying to replicate your data center in the cloud. I, I don't think you really get, you get some benefits, but they, they are limited. And, and I guess the bringing back the risk word, which is... Um... I suppose been drilled into me by doing a few stints in financial services, heavily regulated kind of industries. And I guess 
the problem with what you're saying is to you and I, it makes a lot of sense because we understand, you know, this stuff. Um, I think the problem is when you talk to the, to the business or a risk a governance person about how significant a change that is, they can sometimes get scared, right? Oh, oh that, that feels like you're completely, um, you know, you're, you're taking the engines off while the planes in flight. You're kind of, you know, changing them. Can we not just sort of park the engine? Sorry, can we not just park the plane in a different airport rather than, you know, kind of changing it while it's flying? So I, I guess it's kind of getting people comfortable. And I like your idea of, yeah, pick something, you know, with value, but not too big that you can kind of demonstrate the pathway, I suppose, to um, to production and, and that you know, show that this is sort of possible, de- de-risk it for people and get them comfortable with that that process. Because otherwise I think this can feel very scary. Like, oh, no, I, I, I like the, the predictability and reliability and ownership of the on-prem stuff, <laughs> you know, because yeah. there is, I think there is still this mindset of, oh, you know, I can control and I can own uh, this thing. Oh, and I, yeah, I, I don't know what, what am I giving up? I think these are conversations I've, I've often had with security and governance people. And again, there's a journey of enlightenment that they need to go on as well. And when they sort of see that the, the, the risks are different. Uh, and this is a conversation I was actually having with, with, with Christoph a little bit on the previous one is kind of there are actually mitigations now, like confidential computing is the topic we talked about before, where moving to the cloud, you can actually isolate the workload, the compute from even the cloud provider. So, you know, there is this sort of um, mitigation against you know any any issue that you might have with someone else having access to your you know, your 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 compute or your data or whatever so uh, but it takes people to kind of go on that journey of discovery doesn't it i guess this is different but you just need to you know kind of understand why it's not big and scary it's i guess it's that scare afraid of the unknown sort of thing maybe i guess yeah and it, and it's also it's it's real materialized risk right yeah. like if you go along to someone and say, right, I want to move our entire accounting system. And by the way, if it goes wrong, it'll, you know, we miss six hours worth of transactions, which for some companies is like absolutely yeah. like break the business kind of yeah. situation, right? Uh, if you go to them and say, I want to spin up, I, I'm just picking the latest buzzwords, but I want to spin up a new AR website, you know, or VR website for our customers in you know, a market that's trendy, but isn't a key market. Um, and I want to use this new technology to do it because I think it'll be the best. The risk is just so much lower, right? Because mm. you'll kill it if it, if, you know, if it's if it's embarrassing or if it goes a bit wrong, it's not the end of the world. But then what you use is that, that then proves out a whole bunch of new methods and you, and you can build up from there, basically. Like, yeah. look how stable this is. Just start tracking availability, you know? So like availability of that internal core system I don't, you know, I'm quoting numbers out of thin air, but that might sit at 90%, right? But this random website that isn't that important that we spun up, that's at 99.99999%, right? <laughs> and what's wrong in this picture? <laughs> All right, they should be the other way around. So um, then you can start to have more kind of more productive conversations, I think. And this, this actually is a really nice example of something I did. I um, can't remember if I've shared this with you, but like the circles of sustainability green and carbon and uh, actually the broader sustainability thinking for me includes things like risk management and do you have availability of skills and that but what you've just described there is a tangible example of where you've moved something you've modernized it but along the way you've you know you've, you've de-risked but you've also demonstrated it's more available as well as being more sustainable uh, for me this is this is where as architects and, and ctos we need to kind of box clever right we particularly in constrained financial times like you, you want to make a move on the chessboard or you want to make sure that that moves a whole bunch of things along at the same time. And I like what you're talking about because it's identifying where you can kind of look for win, win, win type situations. I think the, the danger with sort of just doing a little thing is, yeah, you don't really move things on that much, but, but yeah. So yeah, interesting one, but um, what would you say have been your sort of big learnings going on the sort of serverless Sort of journey both at Zeti and where you were before is is there any kind of big sort of key takeaways you would give you would give people that are kind of dipping their toe in the water yeah I think um my big one would be uh, if you're starting absolutely fresh in serverless stuff um is I would say you've got to have a really open mind about stuff because some stuff will come across as a little bit crazy right um the um for example like MVC probably is not suitable. Um, and that will scare lots of people because that's how lots of websites work. Mm. Um, 
those front end developers who have been talking about React for all this time, um, turns out that's actually the best way <laughs> to interact with um, serverless stuff. Um, the other thing I'd, I'd say in terms of learnings is don't underestimate how important that DevOps stuff is. Right. There's, there, there is um, a, a phrase of no ops um, mm. that comes up serverless. I don't think it's really true. I mean, in in principle, I guess kind of in that we don't have anyone maintaining servers. That's right. our team. You know, there's no. You know, but, we but the complex. I guess the complexity has shifted, hasn't it? You've you've kind of removed the complexity of physical infrastructure, but you now have this other layer of this sort of. I'm going to use the wrong word, but like the hypervisor, the the you know the kind of orchestration layer, the the the, the delivery pipeline is now where that's where your complexity is. But it also has am amazing kind of flexibility and ability to do multiple releases and A/B testing and all that sort of lovely stuff as well. But it probably is where the skills shortages probably are, arguably, and it's where you need to kind of get that bit right. It's kind of like, yeah, you no longer care, like you were saying earlier, you no longer care about CPU counts or memory or whatever. But what you now care about is, is your pipeline kind of passing its automated tests and pushing its way through the process. That that for me feels like where the complexity is. Yeah, definitely. That requires, to, to be honest, when when I see dedicated teams doing that, I get a little bit worried because the developers need to recognize that that is now part of their product. That that So for me, the code lives with the product. It's, it's DevOps, not DevOps, but kind of DevOps. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's not, it's not taking some ops team members and giving them a new DevOps team title, what sometimes happens, right? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, by all means, take in, in those team members and work closely together with them. That's the whole yeah. that's the whole purpose of the title, right? But in terms of how, you know, those um, those build and release pipelines, all that kind of stuff live, they, they really do need to live inside the repository. If they don't, then unless you're doing something very specialist that I obviously have no understanding of, I, I would smell, you know, it, it would kind of smell bad to me. Well, it, uh, it, it's kind of, it, it, you've you then got, this complexity of the things not being connected up and there's a risk there then isn't there that you're not going to deploy all the right things because they're not self-contained and bundled up neatly so that for me kind of innately makes makes sense but i still feel like we have throwbacks to the previous era i'm talking i was talking about earlier where you know devops is this sort of thing by name only and it's the pipeline and it's almost the pipeline that kind of connects the teams rather than actually but but i do think uh, that this comes back to what's the size of organization. I think if you're small and agile and nimble and you have, you know, two pizza teams, then I feel like this stuff is easier to kind of get right. When you've got like a big uh, organization that's had armies of admins and, you know what I mean, the, 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 some of this stuff is harder to sort of change. You can't change it overnight, right? This is like steps on the journey. Yeah, and, it, and it's why this stuff, um, I... I personally think that this stuff works best when you spin up a new small thing right, right. because what you can do right. is you can take some forward-looking members of the ops team you can take some forward-looking memory members of the security team so if you you know you want to get your your full um you know bingo in uh in um buzzwords in the in devops you've got devsecops obviously right. and you know forward-looking members of your developer team form those up together and, and they do need to be forward you know i wouldn't necessarily say the most senior always um you, you're more looking for willingness to embrace new ideas and things like yeah. that um and get things wrong you know it takes a little bit of kind of bravery really um mm. and you, you can kind of take those those off to one side and then the key thing is that product has to deliver results quickly because otherwise what will happen is um and that's why you need to choose like a high value visual thing um otherwise those teams will go well why is my top person going off you know messing around with this thing right. when i really need them on the core you know i'm on the staff yeah. now so it really needs to show results quickly and again that's why i try and go serverless very very quick because it will let you deliver fast try and choose something visual and everyone will go right that's actually a really successful project it's a really successful project because of a range of reasons and you know and then and then you can kind of go right well if you want to be successful too let's set up team two and combine, you know, you go from there. And obviously, you've got the questions on management structures and things like that. But those are, 
you know, those are individual to every company. I don't think anyone could ever say, yes, I know exactly how to set up the management structure for your, <laughs> for your firm because they're always different. There's some, yeah, really, really useful tips there, I think, for folks kind of going on the journey. Um, one thing I also like to ask people that appear is, where do you see the, um, where do you see things going in this space? So Architect Tomorrow, we're kind of looking forward to the future. What, what, what is exciting you about cloud? It doesn't have to be serverless, but cool if it is. Um, what's you know, what, what, what's caught your attention recently that you're sort of excited about for the kind of you know, the future of cloud? Yeah, sure. So there's a few things. Um, the first one, actually, for us, um, is quantum at the moment. Okay. Um, so we're we're sort of now that quantum computers are starting to appear on cloud providers. Which so I, as my last at my last year of my degree, I studied quantum computing and. Right. Was like you, partly because I wanted to go into programming, thought it might be a good tie yeah. over, and I looked out into the jobs market, and it was just non-existent. Mm. <laughs> Too know. early. Yeah, exactly. Um, and now you can just spin one up on the cloud for a mere hundred thousand dollars a month. <laughs> um, <laughs> so a genuine pricing quote that I got. <laughs> um, but that kind of stuff, obviously, we wouldn't be spending that kind of sum. No. Um, but it actually has some quite good applications in our financial like risk models. Okay. You know, is this where, for like sort of Monte Carlo simulation type stuff? Yeah, right. exactly. Monte Carlo kind of simulations. You know, we already use. Um, well, I've kind of built a system that um, that kind of works, which splits out the work across your functions. So it actually uses serverless as a as a supercomputer, um, where we basically chunk things up onto a, a queue as your event grid. And just say calculate this, calculate this, calculate this, calculate this, and as your functions just scale out massively, um, and that's pretty cool. You know, we we saw um, previous results for Monte Carlo on the the, the trusty Excel would do like two thousand results and would lock up the person's computer for like the whole day. Right. Uh, this system with no real tuning um, did a hundred thousand results in five minutes. Wow. Okay. So, like that's already a massive improvement um but we're kind of and that's just the serverless side when we are kind of looking at that if you're looking at the future of stuff that's the now looking at the future of stuff it's yeah that that kind of quantum side is really exciting mm, yeah no, i think kind of seeing real life applications we um kind of looking at this as well like the um really interesting startup if you've not seen is crypt so they're looking at um using uh entropy quantum generated entropy to improve security um so well worth Having a look at, I've got, I've got, I've got a friend. I'm, I'm hoping to kind of get them involved in, in, in the, in the community fairly soon. But, um, so Dan, Dan, this has been a great conversation. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you touched on a bunch of things that we talk about quite a bit. So I may well tap you up again in the future to say, hey, do you want to come and talk about quantum or come and talk about um, some of the other DevOps or, or whatever? So, um, yeah, thanks very much for sharing your your perspective on this in, in particular, sort of bringing to life the kind of sustainability advantage that that serverless can have so yeah thanks very much for your time no problem thank you very much for having me